morning. Good to see you this morning. It's kind of looking a little bit more like church in here uh, this morning. Good to see so many of you that have returned uh, to campus and are here. So glad you are here. Um, those of you joining us online, we're also grateful that you're joining us. You're every much a part of what God is doing here at First Charlotte, and you're every much a part of what's happening right uh, now, I want you to take your Bibles, if you would, and turn them to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 3. In a moment, we're going to look really briefly at a verse, talk about the topic, and then come back to, to that in just a moment. As we conclude today, uh, we have got a barbecue lunch for you. And so in a moment when we dismiss, or in a few moments when we dismiss, you can make your way out there and hang out, spend some time with us. You can take that to go. Those of you watching online, you're also welcome to join us for that. So we wrap up. Jump in your cars, maybe put your clothes on first, and then come by the church uh, for a quick drive through uh, for that. We'd love to see you uh, this morning. So, one of the hot topics today, the hot topic, the topic of the day, and has been for some time, has been the topic of justice. You can't turn your TVs on without seeing it. You can't open a newspaper without seeing this topic. You can't open your social uh, media feed. You, you can't watch an, a sports game today without seeing the cry for justice. We join in this generation, in this time, cries for justice that have been all, all, always been. There's always been a cry for justice, whether it's racial justice or whether it's justice for equal rights between men and women, whether it's justice for the unborn, whether it's justice to be seen in issues such as human trafficking and so on and so forth. We live in a world of injustice. It's current and it always has been current. It's something that people have been crying for and we see from every culture. You, you move out of the American culture and you move to other parts of the world, you're going to see a cry for justice. Some in very similar ways and some in other ways that may be foreign to our land and so forth. There is a cry for justice. And we hear it very loud this day and time. We fight, we bicker, we argue, we protest, we march, we demand for it. It's a good thing. It, it ought to unravel us. It ought to hurt us. It ought to anger us. It ought to be something that we want to see and long for in our society. Amen. And it's interesting about our society is that we argue and talk about justice, yet our society for the most part has turned a deaf and dull ear to the God who created justice. Amen. God at his very core and nature, Scripture says is just. Moreover than that, in the church, Amongst our people, our people group, our group, we speak so much of God's love and God's mercy and God's compassion and God's grace. We, we sing about it. Most of the hymns that we sing of, of church history speak of his grace, his compassion, his love, his mercy. Oh, it's so rich and deep. We, 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 we sing of it today in, in new songs. We just sing of the goodness of God. We, we love to talk about that and celebrate that and pro proclaim and extol God for his goodness and his love and his mercy and his grace and all those wonderful things. In fact, even in our witness, as we share the gospel with people, we understand the mission of the church, that we've got to be people that share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We typically lead and we want people to understand very quickly that our God loves them. That he's a good God and a gracious God and a compassionate God. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. We, we lead with that. And hesitate to speak of his justice towards wrongdoing. Almost as though we might want to apologize for the fact that God deals with wickedness, injustice, immorality, and unrighteousness. 
It's not a topic that we like to speak of. You, you won't find a, a lot of hymns and a lot of songs and a lot of sermons that speak of the justice of God throughout the history of the church. Yet Scripture proclaims and extols and praises God for his righteous justice and that he is just. I want you to draw your attention to Romans chapter 3. Look at verse 26 this morning and if you would stand in honor of God's word. Verse 26 of Romans chapter 3 says, It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You can be seated. When things aren't fair, when things aren't equal, when things aren't right, We demand justice. And so oftentimes our society and culture and even within the church are seeing and feeling and experience unjustness and unrighteousness and wickedness that is unanswered. Makes us question and wonder whether God really is just. How can we doubt something that we speak so very little about and thus know very little of. We demand for unjust humans to reform unjust human institutions. We literally, as human beings, cannot be just because at the very core of who we are, we are broken, wicked, and depraved. Now that is not to excuse and that is not to mean we shouldn't strive. But I want to say this and this is why I want to draw your attention. The hot topic of today, the striving and demanding for justice is exactly what he is. He is just. The Bible doesn't conceal it. Rather it praises and extols God. And at the very heart of of the gospel. It's not just a message of hope and of peace and of love and of grace and of compassion. It is truly about God's justice. And if we take a moment to remember that we have a just judge, we too can celebrate in the midst of the unjust turmoil that we see and face and argue and deal with each and every day. And as we do, we can fall on and trust on God who is just. From the very beginning of time, of humanity, God established law and order. And almost as immediate as he established it, Adam and Eve acted unjustly and sinned. And God's answer to that was justice. God showed his justice in Genesis chapter 3. And from that point with the introduction of injustice and unjust behavior, unrighteous behavior, sin, all humanity has rebelled against the just God. Listen, injustices experienced today are a result of what happened in Genesis chapter 3. When man fell all of man fail. And as a result of that, we live in a world that is riddled and full and corrupted with injustices. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it will always be this way. That doesn't mean we excuse it and just move on and say, well, that's just the way it is. No, 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 no. But we need to understand that the source and the heart of injustice is not God. It's man. And it's every single one of us. Because clearly scripture indicates from the very beginning, the establisher of the law is right and just. In both the Hebrew language and in the Greek language, which the Bible was written in, 
There's one word in Hebrew and one word in Greek that describe a word that we make many words out of. You see, the word right and righteousness and justice and just are from the same word in both Hebrew and Greek. They're impartable. God is righteous. He's good. And being good encapsulates just, justice. Psalm 89 verse 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Isaiah chapter 33 verse 22, for the Lord our for the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Psalm 48, verse 6 through 7. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. God is the standard, and the law. And he brings justice. He is, at the very core of who he is, perfectly just and right. All that is right, God is the source of. He determines and he says what is wrong and right. God sets the boundaries by his very nature. That which is against him is wrong. That which is like him is right. He is the one that determines. It's it's not a, a floating liquid thing that moves from culture to culture. There is right and there is wrong. And our Bible says very clearly it's God that establishes that absolute law. By who he is in his nature. He has the ability and the authority to determine right and wrong. He sets the boundaries of morality and has gone to great lengths to help us understand and let us know. Even in the very beginning, God gave one rule, one thing. As it transpired and continued on. God dumbed it down and made it easy for people when there was a whole lot more. Here's 10 things, 10 commandments, 10 rights and 10 wrongs that you need to understand. And throughout time and throughout scripture, God has established and listed and revealed his good law. God is just. And listen, in his justice, he judges justly. Now, good government is hard to find. Amen? We can all agree on that. No matter what side of the aisle you're on, we're all all in unison and in agreement that good government is hard to find. And though God establishes government and law and rule and order and ordained it all, the moment that you put humans in charge of that government and law, begins to be corrupt. Power and selfishness, hypocrisy, pride, greed, hubris, favoritism, preference, and immorality begin to seep in and through and eventually determine the tone and direction and course of that law, of that government, of that establishment. It it is a complicated system and we feel it throughout our lives, all of us. And and, and through time, we feel the complexity of this system and and, and in a sense, hint and feel somewhat of an anger or a fear or questioning, a corruption. But God's governance, God's rule, God's judgment is not like that. He is a just judge. Righteous, perfect justice. Righteous and perfect judgment. Psalm 7, 11 says, God is a righteous judge. 
Jesus himself says in John 5 verse 30, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 7, and if you call upon him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deed, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile. And Paul declares at the end of his life with a sense of hope and trust in the just judgment of God when he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 8, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. You see, God is a just judge and judges justly. There's no corruption in his order. There's no corruption in his eyes and his sight and what he delivers out. He is one who sees all and knows all. He judges with clear vision. Nothing clouds his judgment. He knows all actions, and he knows all of the motives behind all of those actions. And he knows all of the thoughts in the head that led to the motives, to the action. Nothing is hidden from him. He is infinitely suited to fulfill his role as the just judge in the context of his omniscience And his omnipotence, that he sees and knows everything, that he can do anything, and that he is everywhere. Nothing is hidden from him. You think of the difficulty of of our legal system. It's not like that. You have a judge and you have a jury who have a limited ability to distinguish And decipher between truth and lie. You have eyewitnesses that testify. That also have a limited ability to recall everything. Moreover, you bring into biases, tendencies, preferences in that which seeps in corruption. You have the threat and the worry of perjury that even just because a person says something, puts their hand on a Bible and swears by God, they're telling the truth. (laughs) Humans can lie. Did you know that? And can lie under oath, willing to purge themselves. And so it's, 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 it's fallible. It's not perfect. Not everything is seen, and not everything is known in every circumstance. And though some things are clear as day, many things are not. And there are times in this fallible and flawed system that there are right people convicted wrongly and wrong people that are not convicted at all. Just this past week, it was a big headline in our local news that a man by the name of Ronnie Long was let out of prison after 44 years. His sentence was vac- vacated on the grounds that had his trial in the 70s. There was evidence that was intentionally withheld. But God... possesses every fact to the finest degree. He fully comprehends all motives as well. He doesn't need an eyewitness to come forth. He is the eyewitness. And he doesn't perjure. For the scripture says it is impossible for God to lie. He judges impartially. His ruling is the most informed. No one is ever wrongly convicted in God's court. Justice is always served in his court every single time. He is a just judge. Listen to what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 10. 
I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. I give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. And then Jesus reminds in Revelation chapter 2, verse 23, all the churches will know that I am him who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to his works. Perfect justice in God. He is just and he judges justly. Perfect justice. No corruption, the right decision always. The right verdict every single time. Yet we don't always see his justice. We question whether he is. As a people who mostly focus on his love and his grace and his mercy and his compassion, we see so many things that seem so in, unjust. We see partiality. We see the wicked going unpunished. The innocent being taken advantage of and nothing seems to be able to be done about it. We have a saying, crime doesn't pay, but it does. Where is the justice? What, God, what are you doing? How can you let this see? People who, who don't understand the justice of God, people who are so concerned and with the, the loving and the compassion and the good and the merciful God, and that's where our focus is and that's where our singing is, and a world that doesn't even look to him in the midst of this argument. Many things go so and seem so unjust, and we begin to bring our questions to God. How can a good, merciful, loving God let this happen? Let this go on. This is not a new question, by the way. This is not something that we've invented in 2020. It's a question of the ages. Psalm 98, 94, the psalm writer says, how long will the wicked prosper? Because they're doing pretty good today still, aren't they? Job chapter 19, verse 7, Job declares and cries out, behold, I cry out, violence, violence violence but I'm not answered I call for help but there is no justice Habakkuk says in chapter 1 verse 4 so the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth calling to question God's justice we don't question that he loves we don't question that he cares then why doesn't it end we need to understand, and as God answers every one of these situations and every one of these questions, we need to understand that one lifetime is not enough to fully capture the depth and richness of his justice. We see a partial display of an infinite, eternal God. Listen, friends. God's not bound by the TV show Law and Order. Where you can get a whole story, an injustice done, and it's all worked out and it's all solved and we're all happy at the end of that in 45 minutes minus the commercial breaks. He's the alpha and the omega. The first and the last. The beginning and the end. Friends, he has the first word and he has the last word. And what we see on display before us is a patient God working through time, working his plan of justice through it all, and it ends with him. Because this just judge in his justice, listen, punishes sin. 
God does not ignore, overlook, nor is he unaware or blind to injustice and sin and wrongdoing. It's quite the opposite. God is fully aware of it. He watches it more than we do. He keeps account of it and he deals with it justly. Peter said in 2 Peter chapter nine, uh, chapter 2 verse 9, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Paul says here in Romans chapter 2 verse 16 that on that day when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Psalm 711, God is a righteous judge, a God who feels indignation every day. How does God feel about the injustice and the sin and the wickedness of this world? It infuriates him. It angers him. His wrath burns hot at it, and he will deal with it. Because listen to what Nahum says, Nahum chapter 1, verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger, great in power. But the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in the whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are hidden, are with are, are the dust of his feet. No one gets away with anything before God. Nothing is hidden from him. God sees, God knows, and in his justice, he acts. God does not ignore, overlook, is not unaware, is blind to sin. He sees it all. Injustice, wrongdoing. He watches, he keeps account, and he deals with it justly. Every wickedness God will deal with. Every innocent life that's taken, God will handle. Every person that has been treated not like a person in the image of God, he will deal with. Where is justice? It's God. Man. That, that's, that's really hopeful. I mean, that's something that we really, we really have as followers of Christ. While this brings praise in the world of injustice that we live in, that God answers it. He does. Man. God answers it all. And that's wonderful. But listen, friends, it ought to also bring fear in you. Because look, if you would, back at Romans chapter 3. Verse 10. No one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Look at verse 20. For the works, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. And then clearly stated in verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are so quick and we are so pointed at the injustices that other people commit and the sin and the wickedness and the wrongness that other people commit, not realizing that we're in that boat too because we're humans too. Every single one of us has preferences and every single one of us has a tendency towards sin and every single one of us stands guilty before a holy, righteous God and we will not get off the hook. God can't let one group of people off the hook and not deal with the other. He's an impartial judge. So whether you are American, whether you are Republican, whether you are Democrat, whether you are white or black or Muslim or Middle Eastern or, listen, Western, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're a Tar Heel fan or a Duke fan. <laughs> All of us stand accountable to the righteous judge. All of us Stand.
condemned. Oops. But he's loving. And he's compassionate. And he's gracious. And he's merciful, right? Yes, he is. Let me ask you this. Let me paint a picture for you. Let's just say, for instance, a person commits murder. And they're brought to trial. And in that trial, as they stand before the judge and the jury, the evidence is very clear. I mean, it's very clear evidence. There are eyewitnesses that recall the account. In fact, the murder was caught on film. There's, there's nothing really that this man can do to say that he's not guilty, that he didn't commit it. His, his fingerprints are all over everything. It's caught on film. Other people saw it. There's no doubt, no question that this man committed murder. In fact, his, his attorney has really got no pathway to free him other than asking for leniency or something like that. And so it's very clear that the man is guilty. And the jury convicts him as guilty. And so now it's time for the sentencing. The judge looks at everything. He's held the whole case. He's made sure that everything is right. There's no question about it. This man's guilty. It was a unanimous decision just like that because it was so obvious. But the judge, being a man of compassion, mercy, looks over the man's record. You know what he finds out? This is the only murder this man has ever committed. In fact, you take this out, he's actually a pretty good guy because there's nothing else on his record. Pays his taxes, graduated high school, college, married, good man, calls his mother every week, helps people, goes to that church, good guy. And so in his compassion and his mercy and his love, the judge says, listen, man, what you did was wrong, but, man, you're a pretty good guy. So I tell you what, don't do it again. You're free. Jesus. That sounds like that judge is what? Not good. His job, his role is to judge justly. And there's other people who have done the same thing that are paying a crime and sentenced to that crime right now. And there's other people that have done less that did not get off, but yet he lets this man get off. You see, He's not a good judge when he simply acts in love and compassion and mercy. He must punish wrongdoing. And to not punish wrongdoing means he's not just. If God doesn't punish your sin and my sin, there is no justice with God. And for that matter, he's not good. He is a softy. We can't trust him. We can't depend upon him. And he's not right because the wicked go free. But our just judge, in his grace, does just that pardons sinners how can he do that how can he let wickedness and how can he let that off the hook how can he move on in his grace God judges Jesus and pardons sinners Look, if you would, at verse 21 of Romans chapter 3. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested 
apart from the law. God has delivered and displayed his justice, his righteousness apart from the law. Through the law and the, 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 law and the prophets declare witness about it. Verse 22, the righteousness of God. This is it. Through faith in Jesus for all who believe. For there's no distinction. Verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And here is the solution. Verse 24, and are justified by his grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You see, listen, God can pardon the sinner. He can let the murderer go free. Not based upon that man's record or that man's lifestyle or what that man does for his mother every week. Not based upon his guilt or his freedom, his innocence or his guiltiness. God can pardon the sinner and remain just because he punishes his son in their place. Verse 25, Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. See, brother and sister, friend, you were guilty and are condemned and there is nothing you will ever be able to do when you stand before a righteous, holy God to get off the hook. But this loving, compassionate God in his justice took one that is perfect and is holy and he stood in your place and God sentenced him. Slaughtered him in your place on the cross. And his blood is your freedom, forgiveness, and justification. So, verse 26, all this was to show his righteousness, his justice at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Jesus is the just God's judgment of sin so that he can pardon and forgive the sinner. And Paul explains to us how that happens in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For our sake, he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Through Jesus, we are free. Through Jesus, God's justice is satisfied. God is just and justifies us. And this is how real it is for you. Because Christ Jesus was punished in your place, God would be unjust to punish you for a sin that has already received its recompense. That's why faith, as it says here in verse 26, the one who has faith is so vital. Because he punishes sin. And either you by faith can allow Jesus Christ to take your punishment or by rejection you could face it yourself. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is just and Jesus is is his justice for you. Let me just say a few things and we'll close with this. The justice that God has placed upon Jesus is available to you. And it's equally available to everyone. His blood is deep and rich enough to pay for whatever sin, whatever life you've lived. And for that matter, whatever life anyone's ever lived. 
Let me say something else. This is really important as people of the gospel, which is a gospel of justice, to understand this and to lean upon this hope. We will never see a world without wickedness. We'll never see a world without injustice. It doesn't excuse it. But we will in heaven. Because in heaven there's no racism. In heaven there's no murder. In heaven there's, there's no violation of the innocent. In heaven there's no human trafficking. In heaven there's no liar. There's no pride. There's no alcoholism. There's no rape. We will experience justice. And we will live as followers of Christ one day in a world without it. And until that day, the people like you and me who have experienced the justice of God must imitate it, must pursue it in a world that deeply needs it. Because at the end of the day, and I don't mean to make light, and I don't mean to be just simply a preacher, but I believe this with all my heart, that the answer to the problems that we see today, name it, the answer to that is a heart changed by Jesus Christ. Amen. And the people that know Jesus Christ and have the responsibility to communicate him to this world, that's what our mantra ought to be. That's what our banner is that Jesus can fix it. Jesus can fix racial injustice. Jesus can fix abortion in this country. Jesus can fix human trafficking. Jesus can fix people being treated unequally and unfairly. Jesus can, can fix it all because that's what the gospel does. And that's who people need to know more than anything. Jesus, Amen. our just judge. Amen. Let's pray. We praise you for your justice. That wrongdoing and sin, wickedness, you deal with it. You punish it. And there will be a day where it will all be thrown, Lord. And we praise you for that day. And all those that have promoted it and done it will be thrown forever into the lake of fire along with the one that invented it. And I thank you, Lord, that that, that punishment would include me were it not for Jesus. We thank you for the gift of Jesus that he bore your justice, that he bore my penalty and my sin and changed my heart and continues to do that, continues to promote his righteousness, his goodness and his love and his compassion and his mercy in me. And may we, your people, be the people that let him do his work in us and through us to this world that so desperately needs Jesus. You are a God of justice, a God of goodness, a God of mercy, a God who sees all, knows all, can do all. Infinite, unchanging. We need you. We trust you. Use us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm so glad you joined us for worship. I hope you were blessed by the time that we've spent together. Um, God is a God of justice. He judges justly. And he's judging you and he's judging me justly. And we've got to stand before him one day. But by his grace, 
by his grace, because of his compassion and his love, he has judged Jesus so that you and I can be pardoned and your sins can be forgiven and you can stand before him acquitted and free, forgiven to experience eternal life with him if you'll trust in Jesus Christ. Would you do that today? We'd love to talk to you about your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Here on the screen is a number. And if you'll text the word Jesus, one of our pastors will be glad to speak with you about a relationship with Jesus uh, and walk you through the moment of you giving him your life. Or if there's a way that we can pray for you today, you can text that word as well to that number. We'd love to pray with you. Hey, church family, don't forget, September 13th, as we move forward with all the things happening as we go into the fall, we're really excited about the fall, but September 13th, we're working to bring everybody back to our groups. We're better together. We're better in worship, but we're also better in groups. And so we want you to engage with one of our groups. And for those of you that are staying home during this season of COVID, there's a way for you to be a part of all of our groups, whether it be a, a, a community group that meets outside of campus uh, during a weeknight or Sunday night, or be here on campus, our Sunday school classes. They're all available virtually through Zoom. And we would love to get you connected with those classes this semester. So be looking for the information. Um, Noah's going to talk about it in just a moment, but there's also going to be information coming through email and through our website that you can get linked up and connected with one of our groups. We're better together and we need, we need groups. Fall is going to be a great fall this semester. We are starting our first Wednesdays. Our first one is this week. Our children and their families will be here on Wednesday night for Family Olympics. We've thought of some cool ways to do a, a, an Olympics here on campus outside, socially distanced safely. We'd love to have you uh, be a part of that. Information is on our website about that, and we hope to see those of you with kids this Wednesday night. We love you. We hope you have an awesome rest of the week. Hang around just for a second. Noah's got some great information about things happening in the life of our church, and we will see you next Sunday.